Welcome to Beyond Wall Street, presented by Arixa Capital, where expert investors make their unique investment strategies easy to understand. I'm your host, Jan Bresky, and today we'll be talking with Lance Holman, president of Holman Capital. We'll be discussing financing infrastructure for small cities and public agencies. Lance, it's a pleasure to see you today, and thank you so much for being available for this interview. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed meeting you at a conference where we both spoke recently, and you have a very innovative and and differentiated approach, and so I'm excited to dig into the details. I wanted to start with, uh, with a quote that I read, which I think is very apt for today's talk, which is Howard Marks gave an interview recently on Yahoo Finance, and he said, the best opportunities are not in the public markets. He said, it's just too easy to access those investments. So I think we're going to be talking with you about a private market version of something that everybody, a lot of people have in their portfolios, which is public finance. So I'm excited to get into it. For starters, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your career and, and how you got to, uh, to your current place in your career? Sure. I went to Indiana University. I started out wanting to be a U.S. senator, and then I switched to finance, and then I went to graduate school in Denver and got a master's in business and a master's in finance, and my mentor introduced me uh, to the Rocky Mountain president of U.S. Bank, and they put me on the trading floor in Minneapolis, And I began to uh, buy and sell fixed income bonds. Did that for about five years. And then I got hired by Bank One Leasing Corporation and got into the world of public finance and started financing municipalities. Then I went to work for SunTrust and I pitched to my boss that instead of just financing equipment, we should focus on infrastructure, facility, energy, and equipment needs And instead of just focusing on the larger public agencies in the United States, why don't we develop a new business unit that focuses on small and medium-sized governments and give them a world-class solution and the attention that they need? Uh, And the bank in 09 said, great idea, we're not going to do it. And I resigned, created a board of directors, and I launched Home and Capital Corporation. So let's talk about that. What is the business of Holman Capital Corporation today? So today we, uh, again, finance the equipment, infrastructure, facility, and energy needs of state and local governments. Transaction sizes are as small as 250000 up to $100 million. Uh, but most of our deals traffic in the $1 to $30 million range with financing terms anywhere from three years out to 30 years, but most of our financings are 10 to 20 years. Our investors are primarily uh, community banks that do not have a public finance department. And effectively, we become their public finance uh, department. We originate the transaction, we underwrite it, we price it, we document it, and then we assign our interest or co-invest in that loan alongside the community bank. And so we've been able to uh, attract local capital here in California for local projects in California. And we do the same thing in Utah and Washington and Colorado. So we've expanded to a number of states. So this is related to municipal bonds, I believe. Many people like to hold bonds in their portfolio. And among the most popular are these state bonds and local government bonds because they're double tax free in California. No federal tax, no state tax. So what you're doing is quite closely related to that, but it's not publicly traded. Can you explain a little bit more the relationship between municipal bonds and the kinds of loans that you're making? Yes. If you compare them side by side, um, the similarities are they both uh, lend money to the government. They both finance the infrastructure. The differences are the players involved. In a municipal bond, you have a lot more people involved in the transaction. You have a rating agency, uh, you have a trustee, you have an underwriter, you have ongoing disclosure, and you have a financial advisor. Well, that entire team of financing professionals has to be compensated. And so it comes out of the yield that the investor otherwise would have received. But if you do a loan, 
uh, then you don't need a rating agency. You don't need a trustee, an underwriter, a financial advisor, and you can go direct and the investor will now be able to uh, get a higher yield. But in able to do that, you still need someone with the expertise and the relationships and the commitment to originate the transactions and properly underwrite them. And that is our role. So we're in the middle acting as the guardian for the investor to search and underwrite and place those transactions for the investor. Terrific. Let's go through a specific example. Could you talk about a loan that you were involved in recently and give us a profile, what was being financed and, and some of the other details? Sure. So here's a deal. It's $30 million for a city here in California. The city wants to build a new water treatment plant. Uh, the city would like to finance that project over a given period of time. And we come in and along with our strategy of finding a way to structure the deal that is in the best interest of the municipality, but also in the best interest of the investor. And then we have streamlined the documentation. So we literally have automated all the legal documents. We push a button and all of our contracts are done in literally 45 seconds. And now we have eliminated the need for the high price legal counsel. We have underwritten the deal. We have eliminated the need for that rating agency. And we price primarily off treasuries, which are most fixed income instruments are priced off of. So we price off the treasuries and we have a spread above the treasuries. And we want that, that spread above the treasuries to be attractive enough for the investor to get their return and then attractive enough for the municipality to efficiently fund their project. So you have a loan that you originate and it's financing a water treatment plant. Is that for a city or a county in California? It would be for a city or a water district. Okay. Is it guaranteed by anything beyond the revenue of that of that facility? Is the is the state, the city or the water treatment district backing that credit? So legally, uh, the municipalities cash flows, the ability to charge the rate payer a rate for that water is backing it. So as long as people in that uh, coverage area need to drink water or need to use water, they will buy from that public agency. The public agency is at the end of the day is a natural monopoly. No one else is out providing the water, the police and fire, uh, the city services. So it's only one place to go. And, and since you need large infrastructure to deliver these services, uh, cities have become that place. And so therefore they have the ability to raise the price uh, of the water uh, if necessary to cover their operating expenses plus any debt service. I see. So if this were a water treatment plant for the city of LA, they would probably issue a bond for it. And maybe instead of 30 million, it would be 300 million and they'd issue a public bond. Is that is that how they would finance it in a big city like LA? That's right. So if you go to a big city like Los Angeles, uh, uh, then you're probably better off with the bond, uh, meaning the municipality is because their cost of borrowing could go down. But if you're a smaller, medium sized city, and you're looking at a $30 million transaction, you're probably better off with the loan. And that's who we target. This really resonated with me when I first met you, Lance, because our business is making loans on smaller real estate projects to real estate investors and developers. And I've learned that these niches that are harder, harder to find and a little bit off the beaten path are where you can get more attractive returns. And Gosh, there's hundreds and hundreds of small cities and counties around the U.S. that also need a water treatment plant. It's not just the Los Angeleses of the world that need that. So you really have a very large market that you're serving, right? Yeah, there are about 130,000 municipalities in the United States. Um, they spend about $4 trillion a year. Uh, so it's big business. Now, you have to identify 
each of the decision makers. And then you develop marketing campaigns and you go out and, and meet with them. And then you show them how they can uh, procure their assets more efficiently and then, sub- and then subsequently finance those assets more efficiently as well. Okay, well, let's go back into the investment a little further because it's evident that you've identified a huge market and um, all these smaller municipalities that don't have enough critical mass to issue bonds on their own and that they need to borrow. And they do have that natural monopoly to make the payments. So, so let's analyze the investment a little further. For the water treatment plant, what's the maturity of that loan going to be in that case? Is it 20 years or something else? So that's part of our strategy. In, in a traditional bank, they would show a 30-year loan uh, and it would be a fixed rate. So you have a fixed coupon for 30 years and you'd have a 10-year no-call provision in that structure. In our strategy, uh, we basically lock in the rates for 30 years if that's what they want. But then we also show them that they can lock in for 10 years at a time. And we reset the rate every 10 years. And by doing that, in general, you're going to cut the financing term down from 30 years to roughly 22 years. Now, the investor still gets a higher 10-year rate. And then at the end of 10 years, the rate resets. Rates have been uh, pretty stable the last 10 years. So you, you should expect that the coupon should be consistent to what it was before, but there's no guarantees. There's some advantages of investing in this versus investing in bonds, municipal bonds. What type of return advantage can I get by investing in these loans instead of bonds that are backed by these types of loans? Uh, the bonds will pay you about 1% to 3% tax-free. Um, these loans will pay you about 2 to 4% tax-free for the same municipality. So it's the same credit. Uh, it's just that with the with the with the loan, you don't have all of these other outside uh, market participants involved, like law firms, rating agencies, trustees, and underwriters. You don't need them in a loan. The deal is smaller, and by removing them from the the cost equation, the yield to the investor rises. And for the borrower, we can fund the transaction in thirty days. So if you can be quicker, you can be accurate, um, and you can target the right client and show them by, by financing quicker, they can lock in their project cost quicker, then you're saving the municipality money and you're getting a higher yield for the investor. One of the attractions of bonds, obviously, publicly traded bonds, is that they're liquid, especially municipal bonds generally are pretty liquid, although I know these smaller agency bonds may not be as liquid. But you are saying that the loans that you're originating are also saleable. There is a secondary market for them. Is that right? That's right. It's a very active secondary market. Um, This business is dominated by the largest banks in the world. So if you can imagine J.P. Morgan, U.S. Bank, uh, Bank of America investing in municipal bonds, where they're also investing in municipal loans. So for years, those banks originated those loans and traded and then sold those loans back and forth to each other. And that's what they currently do today. Uh, What I did was I went to a new group of investors, the community banks, and created an entirely new market. And now those banks are now buying and holding that paper for the term of the financing and generating the yield from that investment. But if they wanted to sell, they could sell to another community bank or they could sell to Bank of America or JP Morgan, anybody else, or any other individual investor as well. Do you think that this asset class will end up in the portfolios of wealthy individuals or do you think that it naturally sits on a bank balance sheet long-term? The evolution of the business is to move from the bank balance sheet to a hybrid of also individual investors. So if you had a very wealthy investor uh, who had $20 million to invest, then I would be happy to to talk to them 
because my deals are between, you know, again, one to $30 million. So we could create a portfolio for them. But let's say you had an investor that had $5 million of, of discretionary capital. Then our next step is to create a fund for those investors. So instead of that investor putting their money in their uh, checking account and getting zero, now they can get two to 4% tax free by uh, putting it into this uh, loan and, and having those funds paid directly to their checking account. And how long would I need to invest for before I would get my principal back in this type of investment? It can be anywhere between uh, one year to 30 years, but most of the transactions are between 10 to 20 years, but it pays like a mortgage on your home. And so you're going to get back half your principal in roughly 50% of the time. So you're looking at, if you do a 10 year deal, you're getting it back in five years. If you do a 20 year deal, you're getting it back in 10 years half of the principal. Interesting. So these are amortizing loans. These are amortizing loans. Okay, let's switch gears and go into risk for a minute. How do you assess risk and what's the biggest risk with one of these loans? So my investors primarily have been banks and banks have the expertise to underwrite deals. They don't have the expertise to underwrite the public sector deal. And so we effectively train their bank credit officers on how to underwrite uh, municipalities. And so that makes the process very fluid and efficient from us originating a deal, writing up the credit, preparing all the contracts, pricing the deal, and then having them verify everything that we've written. If you are setting up a fund, then you have to have another party um, affirm that the underwriting is, is correct. So we would then originate these deals and the fund could have their own underwriters. If the investor wanted us to underwrite the deals, which we could, then we would partner with a community bank and, and sell half the deal to the community bank so they verified the underwriting. And then we sell the other half of the deal to the fund and now we've got verification on the underwriting and verification on the pricing because we have arm's length distance between us and one of the investors. And the price from the bank to the uh, fund is exactly the same. That's a great solution. Um, that does address the need to validate that it's an arm's length transaction and, and professional underwriting. Are the local municipalities able to deploy their capital efficiently? I think it starts with educating the municipality. The traditional model is that the municipality goes out and wants to uh, bid a project, and then they submit an application to the state for some type of low interest rate loan. The state takes three years to approve everything. And in that three year period, uh, the price of the project has gone from $10 million to $14 million. But what if we, could meet with the client in advance. We pre-approve them for the $10 million. So instead of financing a $14 million project, now we're financing a $10 million project. So we had to educate the municipalities, particularly small and medium-sized municipalities, on what I call the cost of waiting. Okay, so what is one of your favorite things about what you do and this investment that you're originating, if you think about it from the investor's perspective. I believe that uh, I am a very creative person. And when I left my job at the big bank, I felt liberated. But then when I started doing transactions and seeing the reaction from our uh, community bank uh, presidents, that's freedom. You can be even more creative and structure different types of transactions and bring a whole new source of capital and ideas to these small and medium-sized governments who normally don't get the attention. And as I mentioned before, they spent about $4 trillion. And can you imagine giving $4 trillion to a group of people that may not get the same attention that 
the city of Los Angeles gets, the city of Los Angeles is going to get a better transaction delivered to them. And if we can more efficiently deliver not only capital, but how to structure the deal, how to build the project, and how the overall cost and the value of it, that's what I call client satisfaction. And, and I, I just am inspired by that and passionate about it. I wake up every day and I love my job. And uh, I couldn't, I asked myself, if I could go and do something else, what would it be? And it would be what I'm doing today. That is so wonderful, Lance. I'm very happy to hear that. And I understand what you're saying, because I've had that same observation where your clients appreciate what you do and you're part of getting something built that improves the neighborhood or improves the city or whatever it is. So I think uh, that's one of the reasons that your message resonated so strongly with me. Lance, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm Jan Bresky, and you've been listening to Beyond Wall Street.